Those in favor of forcing psychiatric treatment on people say it's for their own good. This sounds well-intentioned, but does not have any bearing on whether involuntary treatment is actually successful at helping most people. Here, we will explore several key problems with involuntary treatment. Number one, there's no reliable process in deciding who to commit. Studies have shown that doctors cannot accurately predict who will make a suicide attempt or commit a violent crime. This results in the doctors having to make a judgment call, and they typically err on the side of caution when deciding who to commit since they are at risk of legal liability and or losing their medical license if an individual were to leave the hospital and hurt themselves or others. The power is with psychiatrists. So they get to decide whether you're sane or not, basically. And if they feel you're not, you could be uh, put into the hospital and voluntarily committed. No more than 10% of the people that get involuntarily committed actually meet commitment criteria. There's just no way that you can prove either that uh, it's in the person's best interest uh, by clear and convincing evidence or that there's no less intrusive alternative. I was so back to normal, if not better, immediately after my suicide attempt that they had trouble finding a label for me. The label I was given was adjustment disorder with depressed mood. That's a very mild label for a suicide attempt. A couple hours later at 5 a.m., the shift changed and there was a new ER doctor and she did not buy my story. And she was like, yeah, you're getting a psych evaluation. So of course, like once you get the psych evaluation, you know, it's out of your hands. I answered all the questions the exact correct way. You know, I, I love life, life is awesome. I'm a grad student, I swear, like this was not a suicide attempt. Um, still got locked up. I think that really shows too how, how context dependent these things are, that whether you're declared seen or not is, is just so, it can, it's dependent on your culture, of course, but it can also just be literally dependent on what shift you happen to enter the emergency room. Number two, forced psychiatric treatment is discriminatory. Psychiatric patients are the only ones who have treatment forced on them. People struggling with emotional distress deserve the same respect all other human beings do. With the medical profession, you're not being locked up because you have cancer or you refuse chemotherapy. You're just like, okay, well, you're going against medical advice. There's a lot of discrimination. Um, and I think that there, there is a parallel process for that discrimination um, that uh, goes right down to all of the people who use the services. When they mandate you to take something that can actually kill you, as lithium did in my mom, she had technically died of kidney disease, and I probably will also. And that a medicine that can actually mandate or coerce you to take something that may kill you, that is a serious human and civil rights issue. People in favor of forced treatment argue that discrimination is justified in order to prevent violent acts. However, studies show that more than 90% of people with a psychiatric diagnosis have no history of violence. Unfortunately, the media promotes violent cases when they do occur, skewing public perception. If you restrain someone that's not seen as violence, if they hit you <laughs> while you're trying to restrain them, that is seen as violence. I don't know what is more powerless or traumatic than not even being able to defend yourself without someone deciding that that's violence. Number three. Psychiatric patients' perspective is rarely believed. Psychiatric patients are not considered credible witnesses to their own experience. In fact, the medical term enosignosia, originally a condition applied to amputees who believed their limbs were still attached, has been extended to apply to psychiatric patients who do not believe they are ill. Rather than trusting the patient in a psychiatric interview, 
doctors usually call upon the patient's family members or another third party to obtain information about the patient. I took the deposition of the psychiatrist, and he basically testified at the deposition that if the patient agreed with them, he decided to take the drugs, he would say they're competent. And if the patient disagreed and didn't want to take the drugs, he, he decided that they were incompetent. When you ask the psychiatrist why people don't like to take antipsychotics, they say they lack insight into their own illness. But that's a way to dismiss the autonomy and authority and, and lived experience of people who are actually being treated, which is always, first of all, a prescription for bad medicine, but it's also sort of wrong from a civil rights point of view and just a basic decency and humanity point of view. Maybe we need to listen to the voice of those who are treated as, as having a, a, a value and we shouldn't be quieting that voice. I'm sitting there after four months, the discharge planner comes to me. She's like, you need a place to live. I said, actually, I have an apartment. They said, really? Yeah, and my children live there. You have children? Yes, I do have children. And I have a job, but I probably don't have a job now because you kept me locked up. He said, you must be joking. You couldn't possibly have had a job. And I said, yeah, I did. Number four, involuntary confinement undermines the patient-doctor relationship. Faced with the possibility of never escaping their confinement, many individuals report lying to their doctors in order to manipulate treatment outcomes. The power dynamic disrupts the possibility for an authentic human-to-human -human connection which is critical in healing from emotional distress. I knew as soon as I woke up that like, I have to make this seem like it wasn't a suicide. <laughs> Instead of being allowed to live your life and do the things that you were planning to do, they're gonna remove you from that reality because society has a problem with you in some way. The same people that are gonna help you are actually the attorney for society, okay? They are the opposition and they're sitting there pretending that they're, you know, a medical authority or they're a, or they're a healer or they're, they, they're on your team in some way. They're not. In our country, in the United States, we don't start conversations um, in a, um, around psychosis. We don't start it with curiosity and openness um, so much. We go straight to telling people what to do. When you're in distress, you're very frightened of something. And I think psychiatric survivors have it very very hard time staying firm because it's very hard not to be very distressed by what they do to you. And unfortunately, if you find yourself in a psychiatric hospital and a, and a, psychi a psychiatrist in front of you, you're going to want to lie. And that is the saddest state of affairs I can ever imagine, to have an honest person feel like they have to lie to get out of a situation. Power imbalance in psychiatry in a closed ward is extreme. So it must go wrong, no matter what your intentions are. But the problem with doctors is that you, if you allow some exceptions, then these exceptions tend to be the norm. The system talks a lot these days about being trauma-informed, whatever that means, but in fact, the system does an awful lot that replicates trauma. And one of those things is to take people who've experienced trauma that has involved a lot of silencing and powerlessness and secrecy, and then put people in a position again where they're told that they shouldn't talk about their trauma because it's too graphic or it's too much for people. The late Judy Chamberlain, one of the first human rights activists against involuntary treatment explained that the system can actually make matters worse. The elimination of individual agency can make people institutionalized, where they lose the confidence in their own ability to care for themselves and come to depend on the system to care for them. Number five, confinement is not effective as a treatment tool. According to the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, there is no evidence whatsoever that psychiatric hospitalization prevents future suicide attempts. People that have been psychiatrically, psychiatrically imprisoned are far more likely to commit suicide. It's so traumatic that people commit suicide as a result of it. If you ask me if, if I felt there were any personal benefits 
to me being locked up because of my mental state, I would say absolutely none at all. After you've been coerced, you don't see the hospital as a way to get help anymore. So what does that leave you? The first time I had electroshock, it didn't work because I was, it was worse I was getting me all the time until I, they finally discharged me in the worst state possible. Number six, involuntary psychiatric hospitalization is physically and psychologically traumatizing. Individuals often seek out hospitals for help only to be shocked at what they receive. The environmental conditions are not conducive to healing, thus increasing emotional distress. Being restrained, left in seclusion, and forced onto drugs is traumatizing. People say that the experience of being locked up is was worse than whatever problem it was that brought them in. I mean, some people talk about being survivors of mental illness. I, I wouldn't do that. Talk about myself being a survivor of mental health treatment. Basically, you're in this, this prison pretending to be a hospital, and that's that was our situation. Anytime a human being has their um, human rights taken away from them, if they're being forced to do something with their body that they do not choose to do, that's a trauma, and it's very serious trauma. There are caring people there, but it is a harmful system. I was pretty much tortured, held down by nine staff, and injected daily. In addition to the trauma they endure, psychiatric survivors receive bills for treatments they didn't request and often cannot afford. While some reformists believe outpatient commitment or forced drugging outside a hospital, offers a less restrictive alternative to confinement, studies have shown it is also ineffective at reducing hospital readmissions and rates of violence. In short, involuntary treatment is unjust and damaging. But what can be done? In our next segment, we will share the most practical techniques on how to free yourself from involuntary treatment.